care of all of that. I want you to put kingdom moments first, and I'm going to take care of those things behind you. Say amen. And I'm able to completely focus on the prophetic. So we're going to talk about the essential elements of the priesthood. Look at somebody else and ask them, do you really want to be anointed? There's been a misnomer with the term anointing. Anointing is not just a heavenly substance and materiality. It is. You see texts of scripture that, that insinuate that with the anointing. First John 2.20 says you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know you have access to all things. Part of that priesthood is that you have an intimate access. Of course, in the old covenant, there was three layers to the temple. There's three layers to the tabernacle. And many don't realize that those three different, the schema of the temple and the tabernacle represented a human body. The outer court is the flesh. The inner court that you do not see is the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. The most holy place is your spirit man, your spirit being. And so the key of what God was illustrating in the old was that I want you to, but before you got in the holy place was a six-inch thick cloth of, uh, uh, that had to be penetrated and broken. That six-inch veil represents what Dr. Miles was talking about, which is breaking and breaching the flesh. Six is the number of sin. It's the number of the human fallibility of man in the Bible that has to be breached. So what are we talking about? When you elevate your personal priesthood, you're going from an outer court Christian experience to living as a holy, out of the holy place of God, where the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God, is able to be moving and, and release through you. You are the living, walking Ark of the Covenant. You're no longer brick and mortar. Come on, somebody. Church is no longer just brick and mortar, but it's blood and bone bodies. You are the Mishkan. Come on. You are the tabernacle of God. You're the moving and living representation of the raw power and presence of God. And that's why when you embrace priesthood, you realize you embrace holiness. You embrace, embrace uniqueness. You know how to separate what is secular, what is sacred. You know how to separate and decipher between the pure and and the profane. You know how to, come on somebody, you understand order and borders and boundaries. You understand how to walk in God's presence with reverence and how to purify yourself and cleanse yourself to prepare to minister to people. Come on church. And so I want to talk to you for just a moment. Are, are you aware, so the essential elements of the priesthood, the anointing also means to be inaugurated. We only use that term often when we are electing in the Western culture our American president. But inaugurated, check this out. When you see all these texts that say, I will put the anointing on you. Now, Isaiah 10, 27, when he talks about uh, my, my anointing will come upon you and it will destroy the yoke from off your neck and lift burdens. The word anoint means also to inaugurate, which means to be installed into office. Did you hear what I just said? It means to be installed into an office. Now, many of us understand the bedrock paradigm is that we, we start out in Christianity with this embracing of an understanding and an awareness that we're sinners. In the beginning, we have to acknowledge that we are sinners separated. We are spiritual orphans. That the, uh, the endemic virus of sin inherited from Adam bastardized us from sonship. Sinner is synonymous with sonship. A, a, a sinner is synonymous with orphanhood. So when you're born again and you renounce the sin nature, God immunizes you, vaccinates that sin virus out of your bloodstream, and now you automatically come into a first revelation which is familial. You are a son. God is a family God. Someone say, I am a son. I am a daughter. And then it evolves when you mature into this understanding that even though I have inheritance, and I'm a son, I'm a spiritual trust fund baby. Come on. God has, has blessings and healings and the power of God and things upon me. Then you evolve to understand servant leadership. But where people have failed to present to the body of Christ is the most powerful paradigm of servant leadership is priesthood. You're, yes, you're serving people. Yes, you're, you're there to help them. You know, and we've kind of so evolved in the seeker-sensitive church culture that serving is just giving people a coffee or, or give them a fan if they're hot. No, we need to serve. What did the priests do in the Old Covenant? They would serve, and they would be able to discern what was clean and unclean. They were, <coughs> they were able to intercede and be a go-between, an intermediary between heaven and earth, and they were able to negotiate with the Most High on behalf of nations. And so as a priest, uh, serving isn't just giving our times and talents, which we have so many amazing people who've taken off of work and, and, and to serve, and they're standing in the back, and they're greeting you here from Ark City Church, and, and even some from Francis Miles International in, in the foyer there. Can we just give God praise for them? Because this is our first conference ever in our new building, and how many of you know 
it ain't easy just to serve and set up and take down on a Sunday, three consecutive days to say we're here to serve you. Come on, let's give God praise for them. Couldn't do it without y'all, man. It's, I love my band, too. I don't even have anyone rotating my band. We still building our band. I don't even know how to play keys and drums and bass. They in there grinding and holding that square every time. I love you and I honor you in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Now, what I want you to see, serving comes with this image of just things that become humanitarian and philanthropic and just alleviating felt needs. No, the number one primary purpose of your service is spiritual and supernatural. If you embrace your priesthood, you could, this is why Peter could say, silver and gold have I none, but, but such as what I have give I unto you. What did he say? He said, I may not have something tangible, but I can put my hand be past this pocket and put it in Jesus' pocket because I'm in a succession of a priesthood, and I can pull something out that money can't buy. I can pull something out that I did not physically, tangibly have, but I have it in another realm. I have it in another heavenly economy, another heavenly commerce and kingdom. And he said, here, take as much as you need. If you're going to embrace and elevate your priesthood, you got to recognize I have a responsibility to embrace a supernatural mandate that it's not just about feeding the homeless and clothing the naked and the poor. That's an aspect of it. But what about this concept of if I give you a fish, I feed you in a moment, I teach you to fish, I feed you for a lifestyle. What if this comes to a place where I can't give you all my money, but I can teach you how to elevate your personal priesthood, break the spirit of shortage and poverty over you, and now you continually can access the throne room and the holy place and draw whatever you need. Those are the priests who can say, my God shall supply all my need according to whose riches? Your riches? That means you go past your pocket and put it in Jesus' pocket. Your riches in glory. Come on, the Holy Ghost lives inside. You got to go past your pocket sometimes. Say, hold on. And then right when you go to put it in, say, well, ain't nothing in here, but I'm moving by faith. Almost the Holy Spirit pulls your hand, and in the spirit realm, you put it in the robe of your Savior, and it just keeps going. <laughs> And he said, but pulling out gold bars in the spirit, pulling out healing, health, and wholeness in the spirit, pulling out prophetic words, pulling out your ignorant of the atmosphere, but I'm about to give you a word of knowledge. I'm about to give you a, oh, I'm about to show you and teach you how to discern an atmosphere in an environment. Now, watch this. What I want to show you is this. Most people, now, I know, now Dr. Miles is going, he probably knows this, but still, I know he's a man. Let me tell you something. Me and him are very similar. I'd rather give you all my money than for you to take all my notes. Because my God, I tell you what. You know how the folks used to say, you could drop me naked in the middle of the bush. But if I got my revelation and notes and what God taught me, I'm coming out with a shout and some sheaves in my left and right. Because this is really the capital of the kingdom. The supernatural revenue is revelation. So you have to grasp this revelation. Ark City Church, you got to grasp this. This is the key. Uh, every person who's visiting, you have to grasp this. Because God has supernatural inheritance, and part of that comes through your knowledge and your paradigm of what it means to be a priest. In this season of serving, you're not just going to minister to felt needs and just give people cups of coffee and, and, and small containers of warm soup. You're going to start pulling out and saying, I'm here to serve. Matter of fact, let me blow you away. You know the word for healing in the New Testament? When you study the primary word for healing when Jesus' ministry came, is the word therapeuto. That's where we get the word therapy. You know what's remarkable? Therapy was very natural like it is today. Just sit, talk to me, tell me your problems. I see what I can do. I see if you, you qualify. You can get, you know, we, we don't know what we can do. Jesus' ministry came on the scene, and he didn't just hear people's problem powerlessly. He didn't just walk. My God, you missed that. He didn't just walk, and people said, and this hurts, and oh, this, you know. He said, oh, okay, well, we'll refer you to a specialist. He said, I'm the specialist, and that word he commandeered and completely hijacked and through his ministry where he said we're not just going to talk about it we're going to be about it when he started changing joints and shifting bone marrows and opening and creating corneas and lenses and eustachian tubes and opening eardrums they said wait a minute what kind of therapy is this we ain't never seen no therapist who can hear the problem and create the solution on the spot and God said the priesthood means you have to have therapeutic you have to have supernatural 
power and ability to say, I'm not just going to sit here. And matter of fact, I'm tired of hearing your gums flap. And I'm tired of hearing you complain. So I'm going to seek God for you. And then we're going to press in together. And God said, right now, we're going to take up your bed. See, the priest didn't have power to just hear problems. He had the power to intercede. He had the power to go between. He had the power to speak to the fit, spirit of infirmity and say, halt, cease, and desist. You cannot cross this bloodline. Now, as I was studying this, let me tell you something that's powerful. When I was studying this, look at this. Do you know the original orga the organic priesthood? Do you know that Adam had the original organic priesthood? Most people think in the Old Testament it's strictly in terms of the tribe of Levi. But I'm about to share something with you that is going to blow your mind. According to Dr. Michael Heiser, he's an amazing theologian. I love him. He's, he's an unbiased, purist to the, to the text of Scripture. He said when God created Adam, notice the Scripture said in Genesis 1-26, let us make man after our image. And Hebrews 8, 5 says that when Moses received the, the, the template for the tabernacle and what he was building, Scripture is replete and tells you in, in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5 that he only copied the original that was revealed that existed in heaven. Write it down, Hebrews 8, 5. It already existed in the heavens. See, we always say, oh, there's an old covenant mindset. Oh, no, it isn't. The entire tabernacle and temple was a New Testament model illustrated in the old. It revealed the nature of God and man and man and God and how to go out of outer court, live out of holy place, be a barefooted priest wherever your feet touch. And when you see Jesus moving, you're seeing the operation of the epitome of priesthood. And he says, John 14, 12, the works that I do shall what? You do and what? Greater works. That priesthood involves the supernatural, but it involves intercession. It involves being an intermediary. It involves the ability by preaching the gospel that when people repent, you have literally achieved under what the Levitical law was attempting to achieve with primitive sacrifices and goats. Instantaneously in a moment, you didn't realize leading someone to the Lord was a moment of priesthood where you were the intermediary between God and man and you brought them to the foot of the cross and your priesthood brought someone out of darkness and into light. The priesthood permeates every aspect of New Testament identity. But Adam was the original priest. It says in Romans. Now watch this. Why do we first, uh, so the, the organic priesthood began with Adam. I call it the organic Ad Adamic priesthood. Now I want to show you this. Because God's revelation to them was that if you look in Hebrew culture that everything God created, even in creation, was really his temple. So what Eden was was an organic sanctuary. It was, it was proven. Theologians will tell you this isn't creativity, y'all. I want you to know I don't believe, I'm believe in being creative, but I'm not creative with doctrine. I'm not creative with the Bible. I'm going to teach what the book says. I'm not, I don't care what the younger preachers coming up do to, to make you shout. And wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Bro, you creative, but you lied. That ain't even in the Bible. But <laughs> No, I don't believe in that. It literally, when he says, I made man in my image, part of that image was he was already a pre-existent, pre-incarnate Messiah who had already had function in the divine, eternal, supernatural temple of God's order. And how? Because we aren't the first thing God just created. Or else God can't just be a creator and we're the first thing we create. Angels alone show you that God has been in the creation business for a while. He's always had a, a cosmic kingdom. A supernatural kingdom that has extended and we're just realizing that there are galaxies upon galaxies and I believe when Jesus when we pass our tests as dirtbag human beings and we are able to evolve to embrace those standards to be priests in the earth realm God will allow and pull back the cosmic curtain and let us see all of creation and say now join your brethren in a cosmic supernatural eternal priesthood over what I have created all over the universe Now, that's in the Bible. If you study the, the, the original Jewish scriptures, that the universe, it says the universe was created. The, matter of fact, thank you, Holy Ghost. In Hebrews 1, verse 5, it says, and we know by the, that the worlds were framed, what? By the word of God. The word worlds there means cosmic, cosmos, or universe. 
God has already had a temple system with borders and order. He was integrating this new creation called man into this priesthood. And when he created Adam, he didn't just create him as a first human. He created him as an earthly high priest in an organic sanctuary and a temple. And he began to teach him how to be the high priest of the organic Adamic line. That's what he was teaching him. And I'm going to prove this to you. Now watch this. It says right here. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> so it literally was an archetype of an organic sanctuary. That's why when he's cast out, he's not cast out of earth. He's cast out of Eden. Because Eden was a sanctuary that he profaned. By bringing sin and not guarding and protecting it. Now watch this. God literally says this. This is so, let me slow down because I'm excited. Me, me and Dr. Miles get excited. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. Now, we can see that parallel of that sanctuary because in Genesis 3, God is walking in the garden. The word walk is hithalek. It's H-I-T-H for all my, my super education nerds. I won't leave you hanging. It's H-I-T-A-L-L-E-K. Hithalek. That literally is the same action that is spoken in 2 Samuel 7, 6 through 7, describing how God's presence would access only sanctified environments where he would walk and abide in only tabernacles that were holy and pure that he created. So now he's walking in the garden, not merely from a relational aspect with Adam, but because he just completely constructed a organic sanctuary and a temple that would literally be an extension of the cosmic kingdom in the earth. So he created literally almost like a transplant. You know, they say this in, 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 in uh, uh, physics and, and uh, astro astronauts and all that that's called terraforming. When we try to go to another world, whoo, you will be, oh my God, this is okay. Terraforming is literally, when you are literally foreign from another dimension, another world, and you try to, t so you have to bring your own atmosphere. That's why they breathe in the, in the, in the cosmonauts, astronauts. So you got to bring your own atmosphere. You got to bring your own apparatus. And watch this, you got to set up a station. You got to set up a station. <laughs> my God. You got to set up a station, and it's got to be conducive for what causes you to thrive in a particular atmosphere and environment. And then what happens, what humans would love to do, and I'm so glad the Lord don't let us because, you know, we can't even maintain earth when we go live in Mars. Get out of here. The minute we get over there, all the land free in Mars, all the Olar gear will come over there. One million dollars for one square inch of dirt front, dried up ocean. I'm like, Lord, just, just keep us on this planet until you come back. Don't let us go nowhere else. Now, watch this. Because as that happens, they will build stations and build embassies and outposts to continue to expand. So when he says, let man, made in my image, he's literally saying, we're going to create an earthly, ordained, organic high priest called a human, an Adam, and we're going to extend the cosmic kingdom of this cosmic sanctuary, eternal, all over the universe and cosmos. And we're going to cause him to be another extension of our temple. Everyone made here is made to worship Yahweh. This is deep. Now, so he's training him. So literally, when we're walking, yes, we see the relational father-son dynamic because really we're talking about a divine family where you're first sons and daughters, but you have been inaugurated. You've been installed into an office. You each have a particular place in the divine eternal sanctuary of God to be able to intercede. This is why you can pray and God hears you because you're a priest. You didn't realize that. In the old covenant, people would seek the priests and seek the prophets. Why? Because they did not have a priesthood. They did not have direct access and we take for granted every day we say Lord Jesus he says yes my child and we don't realize thousands of years of folks killing goats and and turtle doves and pouring blood out like rivers and streets and we don't realize we can say Lord you barely said his name Lord yes my child because you have been inaugurated when you were born again you were inducted and installed into a divine office 
This is why it's, it's, it's asinine to argue and be office obsessed with, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet, I'm a teacher, I'm an man, I'm an intercessor. How about you embrace this office first real well of being a son or daughter and then let that servant mon- mindset and leadership rise to the servant identity is priest and king. I'm a priest. How many of you are never going to have spiritual victimization mentality when somebody says, I've inducted you into an eternal order and you will stand before the face of the living God and make intermediary between death and life? Interme- yeah, that's you. Jesus is the forerunner. He's the prototype. He's the author of salvation. But you can't have success without succession. You are in a downline of a divine priesthood and you represent him. Oh, man, I'm all over the place. Let's go. Okay. The second one was access. Why do we know that Eden was an actual organic sanctuary and Adam was a high priest? Because it says that the cherubim were stationed east of the Garden of Eden to guard it in Genesis 3.24. And then when the temple and tabernacle are created, God intentionally creates the access point and the entrance in the east. The tabernacle and the temple were just human-made microcosms of what God wanted first to be organic. It's an organic kingdom. Let me tell you, we could have AI and we could try our best to do it. You know, you are the highest technology. When God created human beings, there is nothing high. They create computers, and just to get it to focus, they still don't have a technology where you can have 100% focus and turn quick and have instant focus. They're trying to master that. They're calling it retina technology. You are, the, you are OI, organic intelligence. You are a spirit being living in a body. And God said he's the highest master of technology because your body. <laughs> you literally are made of dirt, yet somehow you don't need to replace batteries. You don't need to replace pumps and wiring and equipment and things. And people cut folks up and try to stick pacemakers and do everything in there. And that stuff got to be replaced no matter how high the technology. Yet somehow God took dirt and literal fibers and material and blood is your oil. Blood is running your engine. There's a pump that pumps in your heart. And if you treat it right, you could live for hundreds of years. Science still doesn't know why the heart gives out when there's no disease present because of the, of the virus of sin and the fallen state of man. They've proven every aspect of the human body can self-regenerate. Every cellular piece in the whole human body can recreate itself to live. Proof that man was made never to die, but to live forever. Did you know every aspect, I mean every aspect of the body knows how to recreate itself? Adam. So the access point, the angelic, the Bible speaks in Exodus 25, 18 through 21. It says it again in 1 Kings 6, 23 through 28, that the cherubim were always to be stationed at the access points of the holiest places, which was the tabernacle, the inner sanctuary. Yet in Eden, we see two temple court angels, or we see temple court angels protecting access and exit into Eden. So Adam was the original high priest of earth. He was being trained by God, and then he said, I want you to expand this organic temple. God is a God who doesn't like artificial things. He doesn't like things men touch and tamper with because it dies. It runs down. It's called planned obsolescence. You can barely have your phone two years, and they program it to die on you, so you have to get the upgrade. God said, no, what I create keeps creating itself. and it keeps pumping life and supernatural sustenance through it. And God's saying, no, I want organic priests. I don't want it artificial, given by the oil of men. And that's why God, when he anointed, Saul was anointed with a vial but David was anointed with a horn a horn that was God made not fashioned by human hands that contained an oil that God created from from elements and aspects that God made in nature he's an organic God he wants an organic priesthood of living people and that's why the church has lost its power because it's devolved to a dead organization and not a living organism that when you walk in you right now the heart and the lungs that it's beating in the spiritual realm right now sick people can walk in and whether we lay hands on them or not because of the grace that your heart you each are like Legos connecting building a holy place right in the middle of a room you have commandeered any atmosphere you walk into and God said because you're all priests this place has now become a sanctuary 
And that's why he heals, because he pushes out the unclean thing. He pushes out the wicked. That's why he purifies and saves and heals and delivers, because God's not going to occupy space in his sanctuaries and places that are sacred to him. He's going to push out the splinter of sin. He's going to push out the splinter of sickness. He cannot allow it to exist in his sanctuaries. That's why we could literally go walk into a Hindu temple as priests. And if you know your priesthood and you know the garment you wear in the spirit and the ephod you got in God and walk in there and you know your authority and you're led by the spirit, God says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all the marble they use for these false idols to Shiva and Vishnu. I created it with one syllable and sound. Walk in here and take back territory. Take the land. Oh, I feel the Spirit of God in here. Something is being broken. Something is being released in this room. On all 22.8 acres, it's going to be commandeered and used for the glory and the majesty of the name of Jesus Christ. And every blood oath and every satanic sanctuary that tried to build itself upon this plot is being dismantled in the spirit. And God is raising up no longer wicked and warlock priesthoods, but a supernatural priesthood of all the people. Somebody shout, that's me. Glory to God. Now, I can keep proving this to you from Scripture, but it'll take all my time. But see, uh, uh, i got to hurry up. So did you know the introduction of the eternal priesthood began in Exodus 19? Put it on the screen, Exodus 19, 3 through 6, the New Living Translation. This blew me away. I've known this, but, it, you know, we always, when we discuss the priesthood, we have, we have skipped Adam being the original high priest. And his sacrifice, his first sacrifice should have been. And then another thing it says here is that he was to protect it. It was to shamar. The word was shamar, it means to defend it, supernatural. Priests defend sacred space designated to God. And that serpent in Hebrew is called the Nahash. And there's a lot of theologians believe it wasn't just merely uh, Lucifer, that it was a fall, one of the additional fallen angels because in Hebrew culture, Nahash meant the shining one. The one who gleams, it's associated with seraphim or angels of wisdom. And so really when you study this, just to say, I, I like to throw stuff out because I study deep and I like to mess our religious minds up. We just assume the devil got on, uh, you know, he, he got on uh, 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 red, uh, what's, that, what's that exercise coming? Loomy, loomy doomy. He got on red loomy doomy tights and he got on this. Hel we, we have made up so much imagery that Satan can walk in in front of us because we have false images we've made up through religiosity and have conversation with you. You not even know you're talking to the devil. It was a Nahash. It was a fallen seraphim whose wisdom was to be a representation of Yahweh. And he twisted that wisdom to manipulate the priesthood of men. And they listened to him. Adam, as the high priest, was to sacrifice himself and go in between and shamar his wife as a high priest. And said, fall back. You're not to be in the sanctuaries of God. Exodus 19, 3 through 6, says that Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. This is the NLT. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I have did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings. And I brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me, keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples of the earth for all the earth belongs to me can you do me a favor real quick all you who part of this church and you're visiting i need to borrow your anointment for a minute point to the ground and say it again say all the earth belongs to yahweh he said it belongs to me and then he says and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give the people. Now, notice, if you read too fast, you're going to miss something. Which comes first, Exodus or Leviticus? Are we sure? We're we reading the Bible. Everybody's sure. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Now, did you just see what just happened there? He didn't even mention Levi yet. He didn't even mention 
uh, any of what would be coming through a Levitical priesthood and line and already reveals his heart from the beginning that we already see in Adam for all of human beings that are created in his image. He said, I don't want just priests, but I'm going to tell y'all something. I want a kingdom of redeemed, reborn humans who embrace sonship and daughterhood. And I want to, br- and, and look right in the language, first reference ever in the Bible outside of what we see in the typology of Adam. He said, I don't just want priests. I want a kingdom of priests. He's telling you this was my original intent for Israel. I didn't want just a Levitical tribe. But because they rebelled against him, and you see the narrative where they were in unbelief, worshiping fallen gods and deities, God said, I'm about to set an illustration up in here. We're going to write something called the Levitical law. I'm going to start teaching like the master teacher, and I'm going to put borders and boundaries and parameters, and and I'm going to put sacrifices because all of it is an allegory. All of it is a metaphor. All of it is an illustration because y'all don't know how the cosmic kingdom operates on the earth. So I got to put this stuff in place and start using living illustrations to teach y'all, and then I got to document it for future generations. What a masterful teacher Yahweh is. Woo, there is no God like our God. That's why we call him El Elyon, the Most High. I'm starting, I'm, I'm about to catch an attitude because I love him. Woo, see, when you recognize your priesthood, this is why if you can't call your pastor, it's poverty mindset to feel like, well, I'm leaving the church because I tried to call him and I'm in the middle of a crisis. Wait a minute, you are in succession you are in a divine lineage your house is a tabernacle your bedroom is the holy place what is a devil doing in your bedroom the bloodline is around your body it is around your bedroom all you got to do is put on the ephah and the hekoratai ritoriata in the name of jesus yeshua the high priest to which i am in succession get out of my eden hey somebody give him a shout I might blow my voice out today because he preaching Sunday. I'm going to take my... (laughs) Hey! Glory to God. What did he say? that? You know, that may not seem deep to you, but I love to understand the psychology of my God. The mindset, the pathology of the divine mind of Yahweh. He's saying, I want to tell you something. I'm trying to make y'all a kingdom of priests. I'm not trying to do hierarchies and all this. So I, I want what I had in Adam. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to rebuild that and get us back to where the minute you were created, reborn, you are a king and a priest, and I'm making you a priest. He said, they're not going to get it. I got to make a nation. Genesis 10 and 11. If you don't really, all the way from Genesis 10 through 11, Dr. Michael Heiser laid this out, blew my left hemisphere, my left mind. He said, God had a relationship with all humans. They said they would call upon the name of the Lord and he would answer. Anybody. And then Nimrod came, that spirit of Nimrod, which is proven that he was a hybrid, a demonic Nephilim, half human, half fallen demonic angel, leading people to worship him, creating a ziggurat, a a demonic, not a cigarette, a ziggurat, a demonic tower that wasn't to the stars meeting in height, but literally astrology to worship and draw any demonic fallen agent in all of God's cosmic creation to draw them in for worship. This is where you get a lot of this uh, alien worship. See, you have me, Pastor, you can preach, then you start going into Christian conspiracy. Ain't no conspiracy. Because it's happening around the country. We just had all our senators... We literally had all our, and the Lord, I was preaching, my, my people will tell you, and, the, and I said something that said, they're going to think I'm a, I'm a lunatic when I say this one. I said, there's coming things where people will say angels will, appear, uh, aliens will appear openly and start conversing. It'll be recorded. Didn't I say it when I was preaching in Stranger Things? Yes or no? And it was quiet. Pastor, you had too much sugar in your coffee this morning. Just don't, don't go too far now, please. Oh, please, we like you. Please don't do it. Do you know they, they're claiming 
These beings on, on video, on, on police cameras, literally landing in people's yards, and their message is always against the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always against Yahweh. They literally had our senators. I'm talking about senators who are Christians and believers. It. it was broadcast nationally around the country. How many of you know, how many of you know I'm telling the truth? How many of you had no clue because you turned off the one eye demon and you didn't know none of this was going on? Put your hand up. Well, I'm proud of you for turning off the one eye demon. And they're entertaining. And so even though, here's one thing I'll tell you. The Lord said as he moves the church into the supernatural, if we don't have borders and boundaries, you're going to draw down the demonic from the dark web. And it isn't just demons that are created after Nephilim and human beings on the earth. If God created anything that could ever rebel against him, the only thing that your meditation will do, the only thing that crystal's going to do, the only thing will not only summon earthbound demons that torment humans, but it can draw down demonic agencies and entities that are in rebellion to God in the cosmos. We need a kingdom of priests. We need men of God who can say, I know whether, and look, Hasatan is not just only embodied in a person. It literally is a, a, a demonic rebellion and a resistance. You ever see Star Wars? It's the dark side all over the cosmos that rebel and resist Yahweh because he's so good. He said, I don't want to create slaves. I want to create, when I create, my personality is, I want you to make a decision and a choice to serve me. And I know the consequence of that will be rebellious beings no matter who I make. So now on earth, we have redeemed people and non-redeemed people. Anything God created has the exact same representation. Redeemed creations and non-redeemed. I don't know how he redeems and what he does. Whatever. I'm focusing on my earthly assignment. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to make it. This book is my constitution. God, I have my assignment. I'm not going to get so far out there. See, some people go too far. They be out there, and that's all they obsess over. I'm obsessing over the scriptures. I'm going to harapanan. I'm going to pray. I'm going to build an Eden. I'm going to take what is artificial and eject it. And I want to build an organic Eden in this house, in my bedroom, in this church. Come on, church. Who's with me out there? But if you don't know these things as divine priests of how God operates, how he creates things, you can't tell and help intercede when people are being deceived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could teach like this because it ain't a Sunday morning. Sunday morning be like 20 sinners in here and they're like, oh my God, this guy's a lunatic. You're supposed to be mature. You're supposed to be seasoned. You're, this is a believer's meeting. You're, suppo that's, you're supposed to be born again, saved, and spirit-filled, and we're here to kick you in your tail and say, come up higher. Come up to another level of understanding, another level of revelation. God said, I want a kingdom of priests. That's the first pres uh, a a reference we see. All right, I got 12 minutes. Let's move it. All right, now here's the thing. As you move through that, then you get to Leviticus. I explained what God was doing. He was giving an illustration. I need to create all humans who will be redeemed. You won't just be sons and daughters, but I need to anoint or install you into an office. That office is you are called to be priests, and that's women and men. One amen, okay. Uh, one amen, ladies. Okay, ladies, we're, we're hungry. We need you to go back in the kitchen real quick and fry some chicken. Uh, get up. You don't need this word. Go. I said men and women. All right, all right. That's your last chance, too. You better say amen next time. <laughs> yes, I'm a New Yorker. That's my humor. That explains everything. Now you can release your offense. Okay. So, watch this. I condensed this. Dr. Miles loved this when I preached this in Zambia. The Lord had me condense. Here's the seven anointed elements of the altar. Seven. So, if you are a priest, oh, my God, you better listen to me. If you are a priest and God says, I have an Eden for you, and I'm, I'm going to do the same thing I did in Genesis, the minute you're born again, I'm going to place you supernaturally and spiritually into an Eden of assignment. Your first assignment is to walk with me in relationship. And then it's my aspect of the assignment to elevate and reveal your office and to release you into your priesthood. Are you listening to me? So when you study that, so they had to consecrate land. Why are we here this weekend? With this Melchizedek revelation of kings and priests, what are we doing? We're consecrating a land. Why? Because after you consecrate a land. Why? Because in Genesis, the rebellion of the high priest brought a curse into the dirt. Are y'all with me? <clears throat> now, you, you trick with me because his revelation be out of this world. So I know I could go deep in here because it's the crowd for it. The ground was cursed. 
instantly. So Christians don't realize you're not only dealing with when you acquire homes and you acquire lands and you acquire territories, that there was illicit, illegal altars and activity in a realm that you need to tear down. But you're also dealing with, the, and the Adamic curse does not apply to me. The minute I acquired this square here, I understand outside of the priesthood, the curse of Adam lives in this land. It cannot be fruitful. It cannot grow. It cannot prosper. But I am a son of Adam, reborn through the blood of Jesus, now a priest in succession. And the moment God says, come in here, then it becomes an extension of his sanctuaries. And God breaks the Adamic curse off the soil. But then other things can bring those curses. Uh, it, it, idolatry, adulteries, natural fornication, spiritual fornications. And that's what calls this church. Now, I listen to me. I'm telling you in the spirit. Now, all I'm going to tell you is people have already come to me and confirmed. Okay? And I don't care who don't like it because I'm not going to lie and edit a testimony because it's not cookie cutter cute. Two years ago, we were looking for a church property. I'm going to go super fast. And we literally were praying. And, and, and during COVID, a lot of churches closed. And I'm very proud that the churches kept their buildings. I mean, I don't want none of this real estate to go to secular corporate America. I hope you, I don't even want ever a church even to go into the hands of a Christian who flips it from being a sanctuary. And that's how much of an attitude I got about it. Because if it was devoted for prayer, praise, sanctifying, salvation, the family, the number one family business in the earth, when you talk kingdom, marketplace, and commerce, is the church. And no, it's not just some obsessive uh, uh, obsession of people who are strictly in the fivefold ministry. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 says that the manifold wisdom of God, it once revealed in other times, is now only revealed through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only business God, number one, claims and owns. And what he does is he saves in his businesses. He heals in his businesses. He delivers. And the capital, the asset is not monetary. It's individuals. It's human beings that he loves and he has come to reclaim from the kingdom of darkness. What other enterprise is more honorable than that? None. Doesn't mean others are not important, but even if you own a real estate business and you're a mogul, how are you getting people in the real estate world born again saved and how are you creating an umbilical cord that causes those souls that you regenerated to go right into the dream of God, into community, into fellowship, into discipleship, plugged in, into the microcosm of what God uses to elevate priesthoods. The local church. They didn't come after mosques. They came after the church. They didn't come after imams. They came after the preachers of righteousness who are born again Christians. Here's the element. So now when a land is sanctified, here's what you must do. You got to rebuild an altar. Look at that altar. It's a representation. There's earth from the ground we, that has been just piles of dirt dug up over there. I was walking in the woods and praying. <laughs> Well, I'm going to finish that testimony in a minute. <laughs> Let me tell you, this is a problem with prophetic people. We, we, we. Just follow. Amen. Just follow. I let, so, so let, good. This will tie together. Thank you, Lord. So I'm literally, two years ago, we, go, we come and we, we're looking, and this property is revealed. And then, it was two years. Oh, that's when you know you got a wife. Here she goes. She already got her antennas up. So two years ago, amen, two years ago, we, we were looking and we came to, to this property. No, yeah, thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, my goodness. Let me slow down. All right. So they literally were on this property, and I don't care who don't like it. It's the truth. They were on this property uh, supporting political figures in the Democrat Party, which is the SS of America today, pushing perversion. And indoctrinate, I don't care, it may be the Republicans in one more year. They, they may just go nuts too. They're all crazy. But what I'm saying is they're the ones pushing sexual perversion and normalcy and completely trying to indoctrinate our children. If you don't know that, you don't pray. And you don't know your Bible. And don't argue with me. Okay, so when we came on this property, my wife told me, they up here celebrating abortion, they celebrating all these, this is a church, and it was this church. So when I came on the property, I said, I'm going up there. I said, I'm coming up there. Where is it? And I came up there, and they was out here partying with music. And I said, they're supporting the prophets of Baal in the house of God. 
And while I'm on the property, which I did not expect, the word of the Lord came to me and said, I'm shutting this church down for immorality, corruption, and uncleanness. While I'm on the property, and I'm not saying that I, I thought it was the Lord. It was, it was an authoritative voice, and I know the difference. I called my wife immediately. Strike me dead if I lie. You there? Okay, now you know when a man lies, you just stare at the wife. She'll tell you. Something. And I'm the bomb, man. I bet. Don't zoom in on my wife's face when I'm preaching on Sunday morning. You just never know. <laughs> zoom in on the men's face. And that's why your wife is so perfect in every way. The women back. They'll start beatboxing and, 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 and knock their disc out their neck out of joint. You're right. Go back to the word. I got you. So I said, I want to speak to the pastor. And I was super professional because I'm not going to be, get, I'm, I'm, I'm hood, but I'm not ghetto. Okay. There's a difference. Some of y'all don't know the difference. That's your problem. Hood means I'm trying to be classy and professional. Please don't push me. Ghetto is, I don't know how crazy I look coming out the way I'm dressed. Literally coming out and dressed and no elastic for your baskets and just all craziness out, hanging out. And you don't know because somebody got to tell you. You know you ghetto when folks got to tell you. Don't you know you look crazy? What? Master class, next master class. Etiquette. So, so, oh, help me, Lord. Okay, Father. Sucking my time up. I could do a power move and hold y'all past lunch. I'm the pastor. I could do it, but I don't want to, I don't want to abuse. <laughs> Messing with y'all. All right. So, I said, I want to speak to the pastor. Them demons manifested in them folks that were there. And they knew. I said, no, I just want to introduce. I'm a pastor. I want to introduce. They said, well, you can't see him. I said, okay, I just want to see him. So, long story short, the Lord said, I'm closing it. It was thriving. Lord, strike me dead if I lie to you. It was thriving. So literally, we're looking and praying, and I'm so excited in the spirit. Uh, I, what's the next step? What was the next part? Okay, no, after that, we saw a church come up for sale, and then when we came back to the property, we realized it was the same property and was for sale. It was, it was I don't know how long the time was, but it was very fast. So we came in the building, walking around, things looked much different and all that kind of stuff. And I, and I met individuals, I'm not going to go too far. I met individuals and it was like, and I, put, I said, uh, you know, I want to do an offer. And they said, they laughed it off. I said, okay. So me and her went to the property, on the left of the property, there's a huge pond back there, there's white-tailed deer and turkey. This, this, this is a huge property. You, you, when you're driving in, you drove past of the whole acreage. So when I go, we go back there, we just pray and I said, Lord, if it's your will, I said, Father God, and this was sincerely my sincere prayer. This is where many people miss it. I said, Lord, if this is not what you want for us, we pray for the pastor and the church that you have assigned. Please don't let this building be bought by these corporate people down there negotiating to tear it to the ground and make it a ridiculous warehouse or any other foolish thing when it was a place devoted for prayer. I mean, I messed my carpet up, but here it is. For prayer. I said, but if it's your will, Lord, let it come into the hands of Ark City Church. We didn't even pray long just to bust that religious spirit up inside you. We literally were not out there for hours, like, ay, 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 throwing dirt in the air. We just, we prayed a prayer. I'm telling you the truth. I refuse to lie. So long story short, uh, literally, God told us to go to a school. We went for a year, said we weren't ready. Didn't tell me about a building. Didn't tell me anything. It was a walk of faith. And I was so tired of being portable. If anybody here has been part of Pastor and Portable, it's, it, we love Jesus. We, we, we teach our leaders, don't you complain. You could be dead or a quadriplegic in your sin. Let's, let's be happy we get to come to a place that we can worship God and we're not locked up in prison somewhere. Let's lift our hands and give him glory. Hey! <clears throat> I refuse. I mean, I could be in some slaughterhouse cutting up. I mean, I could be working. A I ain't complaining. I'm glad the Lord allowed me to be in the family business. I'm not good at nothing but this, just the truth be told. <laughs> I'm good at messing stuff up without Jesus. You can't beat me on that one, amen, but the Lord. So what ended up happening is we were contacted by a Christian investment group. And literally, we, we, we contracted from them uh, a couple, one or two moves ago. And literally, 
they said, you know, we, we purchased some property. We're going to build a wedding venue. There's, there's, there's a pond. There's a lake over there. And uh, we're going to start drawing people from the city. We're going to do a, we would like to do a Christian school. I said, but there's a church on the property. So we'd like for you to come and check it out. I said, well, I'll check it out. When I came, it was this property that God showed me two years ago. Our church is about 170 people, 175 people on a monthly basis. To afford this kind of property, you need to be a 1,000-member church minimum. And literally, I was blown. I said, well, maybe it's a quinky dink because, you know, there ain't a million churches for sale everywhere. You know, it's, it's, man, this is crazy. So literally, as I was praying, they said, well, you know, why don't you occupy the church? You can use the grounds. And just, it was just amazing. I said, wow. I said, this is crazy. It was so supernatural. Within our budget range, everything. And, and there's even more on the property for plans and things that, that it's unbelievable what the Lord did. And let me tell you something right now. God supernaturally allowed us to occupy. And in the word of the Lord came to me and said, this is going to be the hour of occupation. The Lord said, I'm going to give land, give real estate. I'm going to take buildings away, take investments away. I'm going to take them from people who are in league, in alliance, in allegiance with Canaanites. And only the uncompromisingly righteous will inherit it. As priests, you must be barefooted, pure, and clean. Doesn't mean you got to be perfect, but you got to hate sin and cut it and amputate the leprosy of sin out of your priesthood. Take it out. Do you know, supernaturally, we've been here over, over six weeks. We, we did some renovations. Amen. God provided all the finances for renovations and things that we had to do. Amen. And this is God, this is like our sixth week, and this is our first conference here. People have got them here to tell you, the Lord says, an anointing to occupy is coming through this priesthood supernaturally inside of you. And God says, you're about to step into Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 8, the power of wealth. God said, don't compromise. Some Christians have been cowards. They don't want to take a stand in culture for nothing. They, 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 they're afraid people will say you're being political because you're talking about abortion. Then another thing happened. One of the largest uh, 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 anti-abortion clinics, 22 full-time employees, uh, uh, millions of uh, dollars, all kinds of stuff, was brought into leader in the into our leadership spiritually and supernaturally and my wife supernaturally has taken the role of being the ceo it was written the accounts were written over stuff was completely signed over don't tell me that god doesn't bless the uncompromisingly righteous and don't you dare politicize murder infanticide uncleanness and affirm what god hates you love what god loves and hate what he hates and god is looking for those people only who will take houses they didn't build and lands they did not buy and wells they did not dig those will be the people that god stretches and said lift your hand and i'm about to put the rod of god in your hand this hour and speak to God ain't got the money. Your mouth's a billionaire. Open your mouth and declare the end from the beginning and watch what I do. Maybe I'll come back later. Maybe I'll, I'll sneak a 30-minute, uh, a little mini, mini super session somewhere because we don't know what Holy Ghost is doing for the rest of the day. But I'm going to stop here because I want y'all to have some lunch. Really, Pastor, this is so good and you're really going to do that for us? I'm going to do it's a miracle. It's a miracle because I got more and y'all know I get busy. But I'm going to stop. That clock says zero, zero, zero. I'm stopping. Praise his name. Come on, hold this rod, man of God. Wait, let me tell you the story of that super. Can I, can I take 10 seconds? So I'm in the woods praying. I'm walking the land because Joshua 1, what is that, verse 6? Somebody help me. He said, everywhere the sole of your foot touches, I'm giving you the land. So I said, boy, I'm about to, this city sticker going to go out there. I walked out in them acres, and I got a little nervous. I said, my God, I made some snakes out here and all kind of swamp and marsh. And sure enough, I'm out there praying. And literally, I'm walking in the middle of the woods. How many of you hike and you go out in the middle of the woods? And, you know, you try to find a hiking stick, something that is strong, durable, something that you can just kind of have. Besides a firearm, you better have a, a, a weapon when you go in the woods. So I'm praying, and I sit down, and I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. And this scripture is coming in me, and the rod of God is coming to you. Supernaturally, there's coming a, a fresh authority. You're going to speak and declare. Don't you dare limit yourself through your mouth. Open your mouth and say what the word says, and watch. And God told me, even with this miracle, Ark City Bay, listen to me. God said, it's just the beginning. Just the beginning. I don't know what God wants to do. He may open 50 acres across the street. I don't know what he's going to do. All I'm saying is we're going to, somebody shall occupy. occupy. And when I look down on the ground, it stuck out to me because usually in nature it's all decrepit and crooked and messed up. And, and I'm just, I'm looking down and right in front of me is this staff. Now I'm not being flaky and saying God just dematerialized it, but I'm also a believer and believers believe. Cats meow, dogs bark, believers believe. So I said, 
I'm being flaky. Hold on. Wait a minute. The rod of God. Now, it had a bunch of mess on it and spider webs and eggs and just there's a whole message in that. And then I took it, and just before the conference, I've been wanting to do it. I mean, spilling every nap. You don't even want to hold it. It's like, oh, God. And I stripped it. I stripped the rod. And when I stripped it, I was blown away at how straight it was. God said, in your priesthood, he's coming to take the crooked way in you and make you straight. And God will not put a rod in the hands of a crooked man and a crooked woman. And the Lord said, I'm going to buff you and send you. And this is what's happening right now. You have the rod of God in your hand. God has not taken it from you. He's giving it to you. God said, but I'm going to buff you and clean you up. And I'm going to straighten the crookedness in you. Because there's a season coming where it's not about how big of a check you can write. But it'll be about how you have released your faith in the priesthood, your priesthood, and in the high priest, Yeshua. And when he says, now say this. I was with Dr. Bill Winston ministering for him before I came here. A supernatural miracle. I'm getting favor with that man out of nowhere. Biggest ministry, in, one of the biggest ministries in the whole country. Living righteous. And as I'm sitting there, I'm not no dummy. I said, I didn't just come here to preach. I came here to listen and learn something. And he said, we had, to buy, we had to buy a facility. And I got on my knees and prayed. And the Lord said to me, and I was thinking priesthood when he said this. He said, now the Lord said, now point to the facility. Look how he said it. This is what called me. He said, and command it to sell to you. Like it got ears, y'all. Like it got your station tubes. Like that facility could hear. Let me tell you something, all of creation was made from sound wave, so that means anything God created has the auditory ability to listen. Why? Because you're an Adam, and Adams are to speak to create. Priests use their mouth. They found out that rocks are many recorders, that they have extracted voices from rocks. And that's why Jesus said, if you don't praise me, the rocks will bear me testimony recorded from the annals and the beginnings of creation to praise me. Watch this, because I got to quit. Like I said, I want to keep my word. Thank you, Jesus. Well, come back. I like all days. That means I can come back. God said, I'm putting the rod of God in your hand this hour. Some of you have dealt with sicknesses, diseases. We're going to lay hands on you today. We're, gonna, we're not waiting until Sunday. You registered. You came to this order. You're going to get activated in the priesthood, and there's going to come fresh oil on you, fresh blood, the mikvah, the water of the living God, to cleanse you and prepare you to be a priest. And every emblem on that table from the sword of the Lord, that's the original sword Paul preached. I found it, not the original original, but the exact make and model of what he said is the sword, the makera, the gladius of the spirit. It's there. The dirt as we've been preaching, prophesying, sitting in an atmosphere of Jesus' divine priesthood. It has already been saturating the dirt and the ground of the land. Already been saturating. This is what's coming in your hand. Every time you receive the word of the Lord, I'm going to help you because you don't realize this man's not up here just flap, you know, yammering his skull cave. He's actually, every time you preach, the Bible said the sword, the makara of the spirit, is the word. You know what that word means? Not written. The rhema. So when the written word is proclaimed and the spirit makes it real and alive to you and you embrace it, this is what it looks like in the spirit. Hold it. The minute the word comes to you and you embrace the logos, the written word, by faith and honor and humility, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. The moment you embrace revelation from the word. Some of y'all can't see this. Let me come. I need y'all to see this. Let me come up here a second. In the spirit realm, a sword is released in your hand from the word of God. And comes in your hand. 
And that's why you should take notes and stop goofing and talking with people next to you and, and sneaking on Instagram. Because the minute he speaks what he said and it hits you and you hear it and you say, oh my God, I'm taking that. The rhema of God just came in your hand. And Holy Spirit says the sword that we're going to decapitate this Nephilim, this cancer, oh my God, this bankruptcy, this I'm on the verge of divorce, this homosexual attractions, this I can't see a fine woman without hollering at her, player spirit, parasitic spirit, comes in your hand. And if you don't get intimate with the Holy Spirit and elevate your priesthood, you leave the Holy Spirit weaponless. The minute this word comes in your hand, God says, that's the key to your miracle. Now, swing it where I tell you. Stab in the spirit realm the unseen adversary you didn't know was right in front of your face. Use my word and declare it. And you'll see a change. Lift your voice and a shout to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, is that the best you can do? Lift your hands and lift your voice and shout to God with a voice of triumph. Yay! At this time, guys, we're going to take our offering. Listen to me. Don't just disconnect from that. This is important, guys. We're going to raise up an offering for FMI, but we're also, if you feel led to sow a seed in the ark, we have some things we still have to build out in this building, in this church. Amen? Be led as you're, as you're led. We're going to take up an offering on Sunday if you want to wait till that moment specifically just to sow in the ark. But right now, we're going to take an offering for FMI. Praise God. Well, some beautiful sowing yesterday. I'm very proud of you. If you don't learn honor, you can't be a priest. I said, if you don't learn honor, you can't be a priest. Amen. Take your seat if you need a moment. Amen. Three ways to give. We're collecting all giving, and we are going to, every offering given to FMI will go strictly to him. We're an integrous house. Amen. But there's three ways you can give. You go to arccitychurch.org. We have envelopes in your backseat pockets. Please put your name. Amen. So we can give you credit for your giving. Smart Giving, we're on Cash App. It's a business account. It's secure. Don't worry. Cash App, The Ark. We've never had one incident. This is a priesthood house. We ain't never been robbed, and we won't. That's how priests talk. We don't play those games. Amen. You can text that number, and a link that will make it even easier for you will send you the direct links to your device of all of those options. Do me a favor and make an in the four area, put FMI. Can I tell you something powerful? The order of Melchizedek, see, this is where people have confused giving. When you read Hebrews chapter 7, and we teach this in our church, there is an evolution. We don't tithe under Levi in the old covenant mind. Our, our normal Sunday morning tithes and offerings are not going to these moments. This is you giving as a seed of honor into this mighty man's ministry. Amen? But what I'm telling you is this, is that in the order of Melchizedek, what people have failed to realize because they are deficient in revelation with priesthood, as God teaches you the evol evolution of priesthood all through the Bible. Do you know John the Baptist was the original high priest? He was defrocked from his position. And literally Caiaphas and Annas stole the priesthood. But the rotation was Zechariah. And it came to John. And he was banished in the wilderness. That's why Jesus goes to see him. Because you couldn't be a priest without being dipped in the mikvah and given the succession of the priesthood. John the Baptist transferred the high priestly role to Jesus in the Jordan. That's a whole teaching by itself. Powerful teaching God has given me. But here's what I want to tell you. Tithing in Hebrews 7 literally tells you, speaks about tithing. And tells you, there Levi received them. Or even offerings. A legitimate priesthood had to oversee sacrifices, offerings, and tithes. You can't have a legitimate priesthood and you don't embrace, you, you, you have no authority to receive those things. Sacrifices, administrative sacrifices, offertory, and the tithes. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is your new high priest. 
And when we tithe, we don't tithe with an Old Testament mindset or give with an Old Testament mindset under Levi. We actually give, according to Hebrews chapter 7, of Jesus and his, being of the tribe of Judah, being our eternal high priest after, the, it says literally, after the order of Melchizedek. So as you prepare your seeds, as you've been blessed today, amen, with Dr. Francis Miles and our ministry as well, as you sow your seeds today, guys, I want you to do it generously and bountifully in the name of Jesus, amen. How many of you already have prepared your heart and you're ready to go? Stand to your feet. We're not going to belabor this. I think you guys are more mature than that. You know what time it is. Remember, do not ever sow an offering if it's, and it's not an act of worship, a free will act of worship done in love toward Jesus and in faith believing. Did you hear what I just said? Stand to your feet. I know some of you are writing. I understand you might be still grabbing, and, but stand when you're ready. Amen. At this time, we're going to bring uh, uh, one of our, our greeters will come forth. We bring our offering. And we believe we bring it the way they did in the word. And we do that here as a sign of worship before our living God. Amen. So you'll follow their instructions. And at this time, we'll release you to come. And if you give uh, through your device, please still come and tap the basket. And when you do, say, I believe I receive and declare the end from the beginning. We believe God is partnering with those who are obedient, not just in every other subject with finances. I believe God's going to do something with you.